What time is it? Uh, four to ten, sir. Captain, sir, off to the watch. What for the spine, sir? Weather's overcast. Wind is uh, about 15 knots from the southeast. There's a slight chop uh, swell from the southeast, sir. All right, thank you. I'll be uh, I'll be out there in about uh, in about 15 minutes. All right, sir. This man is at the height of his career. At 39, he commands a destroyer worth $100 million. Its destructive potential is enormous. The power and responsibility of the commanding officer is total, because his job is nothing less than the defense of his country by sea. He must have his ship and his men perfectly trained to meet any foreseeable threat trained, in fact, to a peak of continual efficiency. After two years in his first command, this man has achieved just that. HMAS Vendetta and Commander Alan Ferris are held in very high regard. He is a leader of men. This is a, a destroyer. And it is being driven like a destroyer by a man who can, can drive a destroyer. And he has 300 men under his command and they appreciate the fact that he does drive the ship like a destroyer and he drives it well. Morning, sir. Morning, Paul. Okay. We've got about a two and a half knot uh, set to the south, sir. All right. This is where we meant to be this morning? Yes, we're a bit uh, further south than we should be. Uh, About 10 miles ahead of the hour at the moment. How far are Melbourne away now? Oh, about seven and a half miles, sir. Uh, we've got about another mile and a half to catch up before we're in station. Thank you. Uh, what's the first serial? Uh, we've got an AA tracking at 8 o'clock, sir. Long time yet. I I sometimes miss the company of, of uh, other people, particularly when something's gone right or wrong. I often feel I'd like to sit down and and talk more intimately than I do. When I first took command of the ship, and we were all very new, very, very new, at the end of the day, I'd, uh, I desperately want to talk to somebody, but we're still feeling my way as a commanding officer. Not being too friendly, trying not to be too aloof, trying to be me, I suppose. And I wondered whether the first lieutenant would invite me into the wardroom. And uh, on occasions, I used to send my steward into the wardroom to ask the first lieutenant to speak with me on a particular subject. And having got him there, we'd chat quite a lot. I enjoyed that, because I did need someone to talk to, to bolster myself, I suppose, in a way to get the feeling of how it was all going. But I don't need to do that anymore, I don't think. I nor, does, nor do they. Uh, it's time and... and getting to know the job, being more secure in the job, knowing more about what we're supposed to do.
Okay, good. Bouldering 180. Well, will you or won't you have to turn? This ship, to me, is uh, is more than a profession. It's it's more than a life. It's uh, in lots of ways. I I think it's an extension of me. I like to um, I like to think that there's a lot of me in it. The way it's run, it reflects perhaps uh, some of my temperament, some of my character, some of the ways I approach life. Uh, Vendetta to me at the moment is, uh, well, it's my life. To me, driving a destroyer is what I think I'm best at. I'm frustrated behind a desk because uh, there's nowhere to go. You're chained to that desk. Range. The biggest thing about being at sea is that you can start something and finish it. You can you can have an impact on what's happening. The whole reason for a destroyer being a destroyer is to move fast and to destroy. It's my ship versus that other ship. And you have to be better. Otherwise, you're dead. You're swimming. So it pays to be best all the time because you're the guy that comes back and lives to be saluted, lives to be the winner. I went to Vietnam in 1968. I can only equate the whole experience to being a little bit like a boxer who for 19 years has trained for a fight and at long last someone had given him one. It was the first time where things were real. Here he is coming through this cloud now here. All right, go ahead, gun. Respect. It was quite frightening. For the first time in one's life, someone is firing back. For real. It makes everything much sharper, much clearer, and you realize that your life is involved. And it's uh, not just practice anymore. The politics involved just didn't enter into it. It was a professional versus a professional. And what his beliefs were and what your beliefs were just didn't matter at all.
When uh, I got back to Australia, I think with the whole ship, we became much more aware of the, of the feeling of the Australian public. And for myself, I, I really thought more about what we'd been doing up there. And the more I thought about it, the more pointless it all seemed. And there were a lot of incidents occurred, not a lot. There were some incidents which occurred which I didn't agree with. For example, in South Vietnam, we'd, um, by day, patrol the coast, off the coast, waiting for calls for fire to assist the army ashore. And the South Vietnamese boats, or boats carrying South Vietnamese flags, put it that way, were engaged in fishing not very far away from us. And they'd uh, go ashore in the evening and beach their boats. And on two evenings, I remember very vividly, we were off this particular village where the boats had been pulled up to, on the beach. And soon after dark, uh, American helicopters flying over this village were struck, were, were machine gunned from the village. Uh, and in one occasion, one helicopter was knocked down. And we received instructions to knock out these machine gun posts. Well, that involved, in reality, knocking out a village, which consisted of probably 20 or 30 houses. And we knew on board that they, that village consisted of the people who'd been out in the boats during the day. Another incident I remembered uh, most vividly was in, uh, in North Vietnam, when on at least one occasion, the North Vietnamese were using junks as markers as we came into the coast. Their gunners would have the, uh, would use the junks which are anchored out as markers, range markers. And uh, at one stage again, we were given a directive if we thought they were interfering with us, we were to sink these junks. Uh, they must have known of that as well, because as we came in close, they held their children up, you know, young babies. And one could see the, the radio aerials in which they used to talk back to the coast. I'd have hated to have been the captain in the event, the single event that uh, I really recall, he didn't sink the junk, which was holding up the children. I've often thought about that, what I would have done if I'd been in his shoes. At the moment, my first impulse, and remember then I was Lieutenant Commander Operations Officer, was to sink the bugger. Because we might have, that, you know, we may have been sunk ourselves, or certainly hit, uh, and subsequently sunk. So my immediate reaction then would be, would have been, I think, to sink it, children and all. Um, but whether I would now, I don't know. In fact, I know. I'd, in fact, I could say definitely, I wouldn't now. You got older. The reason I think is because I'm, I am older, and I am in command. Before I wasn't in command, it was easy for me to make a decision to myself because I didn't have to carry it out. The onus wasn't on me. Today it would be. And I think I would have done what my captain then did and not fired. At the end of that particular engagement, it was the first time I'd really stopped and thought, you know, these are the sort of people that, uh, that might be receiving the ammunition we were throwing in to shore. And it left a nasty taste. In the sort of war we were fighting, we, we never really saw the, uh, the destruction that our shells were causing in shore. Um, and then the sort of things that one was hearing about in Australia uh, sort of started to gel with me. You know, it, it was a, a people's war, people were being killed. And it was the first time I, I sort of looked outside the professional side of life, you know, that they were people at the other end of there as we were people this end. That did play on my mind a little bit. But when I got back to Australia uh, some months later, uh, I, having been blooded, so to speak, I suppose, uh, I didn't really like, uh, like it at all. I wasn't looking forward to doing that sort of thing again. And uh, perhaps the newspaper stories, that sort of thing got through to me. And I, I did sit down one, one afternoon and, and wrote out my resignation.
the major thing that kept me in the Navy was that I had not then achieved what I set out to do. My burning desire since I've been in the Navy was to be A, a commander, and B, a destroyer captain. And I hadn't achieved that. What was that public space we came to the other night? For me, becoming the captain of a destroyer outweighed just about every other consideration. It was the aim that I aimed at all the time. It was the job I was looking forward to all the time, from really from the time I first joined the Naval College, I think. Let's say that Vietnam had, been, had continued and you'd got this ship to command when the war was still going on. Knowing what you knew when you came back, what would you have done? If Vietnam had still been going when I was given command of this ship, I'd have been in a tremendous emotional predicament having been there before and not liking it, and then giving, being given the task of taking a, a ship back to do a similar sort of task. I would have done it. I would have done it. No two ways about that. Um, though I think in the time of doing it, I would have been going through a fairly big emotional strain, uh, because I don't think I would really be believing in what I was doing, but I would have done it. <laughs> without any, there'd be no doubt about it. Uh, being commander of the ship would would go before the other, in fact, I think. Going through the whole thing again, the, the shelling of villages uh, and killing innocent sort of people and so on? Yes, I think I would. I would have gone through the whole thing again with uh, the likelihood of, uh, of innocents being killed. Um, I don't know, it, it, it certainly points out the, uh, the effect of the training of a naval officer. In that he, the narrow training of a naval officer, in that he's, he's groomed from, in my case, from boyhood, that this is the sort of thing he's going to be expected to do. And when the thing comes and is given to him to do, he does it. Um, despite personal feeling, in lots of cases. Helicopter transfer team, close up. Helicopter transfer team, close up. Where's the wind? Well, there he is. There's one in the air now. Hang on. Two, sir. Two came out. Two out, right? Yeah. Get me, uh, pilot. Get me uh, in contact with them down below. Can, can I see people in the water? Up top. Is, there, is a sight on him? Let me know if you can see anyone in the water, please. Let me know if you can see anyone in the water. Looks like the chopper sunk. What was that? What's your first reaction when something like this happens? Get this. Bang. It's uh, a fairly automatic reaction. Helicopter in the water. Uh, we're the closest ship. To get there fast. Uh, prepare on board to receive the survivors if there are any, and also prepare to have the, uh, the helicopter in the water held up for as long as possible so that we can rescue it uh, and see what went wrong. Yep, that's two up. Three up. Roger. That's three survivors up now. Uh, the helicopter's winched them up. Range now, please. Uh, John, it's uh, just under the surface. Mm -hmm. yeah, inflation bags are inflated. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we might try and have a go at picking it up and holding it up. Yes, we've got the four up now. Yeah. Okay. Get a set grip on the, on the state of the survivors, please. Stop both engines. Very good. Can you still see that other flotation back? Got it. Come on, come on. Well, have a good look into the water, please. He's around here somewhere. The flotation bag has burst, and the helicopter can be just underneath the water. They are stopped, and we are moving slowly ahead. Get ready, Captain. Yeah. The helo can see the wreckage of the other helicopter. It's inverted. At 50 feet. And he's hovering over it. That's directly underneath the boat now. That's right. Well, can we go down? Jesus. What do you do? Sharks in the water, helicopter floating 50 feet down. 
No, bugger. Lieutenant Commander Kavner, can he see the helicopter from the boat? He should be just about over it now. Put the divers in for a quick look. Negative. Uh, when we first arrived here, there were about two or three sharks. Now uh, I estimate there are about 12, 14, all in the close vicinity of it. Uh, we won't put any divers in the water at all. What more can you do here? There's little more we can do here now. We have uh, we know that the survivors are in hospital ashore, all OK. Uh, we've marked the last... I would like to take the ship and test it out in a real war situation. I know it would acquit itself well. Would you like a war? I think there's, a, once again, a conflict the professional naval officer in me says, wouldn't it be nice to have a small war? So that things are real, that you're not like a boxer who's continually uh, sparring but never has a main event. And yet the, the person in me, the Alan Ferris in me says, you know, it would be probably be like Vietnam, stupid. Let's, let's say that um <clears throat> there was a war in the next 15 years. What sort of war would you like it to be? I mean, this is the professional man talking now, I suppose. If the professional in me could... Uh, could pick a war in the next 15 years, it would be another one like Vietnam. It would be confined to an area. It would be away from Australia. We wouldn't be fully committed as a nation, but the, those people in the defence forces would be involved. A professional exercise? It, it would be uh, a professional exercise for real. But the consequences wouldn't affect Australia. It's bloody selfish when you stop and think about it. Bloody selfish. On your part? On our part. On, on the professional's part. I'm, I'm not really convinced in what I'm saying. Is I really believe. But part of me does. Part of me does. Yeah, I've seen these, sir. You seen that one? Yes, sir. Okay, well, you can see that we're going to get both air and surface. And we being the major gunship, we can under we'll probably be called away to uh, act as the SAG. There are times when I stop and think to myself that uh, we're a little bit like uh, like boys who haven't grown up. We're still playing um, seaborne cowboys and Indians, sometimes. Um, because it's a lot of it's not for real and to, and to realise that well, it doesn't really matter if you make a mistake. One that doesn't involve safety, anyway. It doesn't really matter if you use the wrong word or you do the wrong thing, because there's no bugger shooting back at you. OK, good. All right, see you in the office room in a couple of minutes. Right, tell the GDP, visual. Hands to action stations, hands to action stations. We have control from the south now, range eight miles. Hands to action stations, hands to action stations. Action stations for a modern destroyer captain is the operations room deep inside the ship. Here there are no windows. Commander Ferris can see nothing of what is going on outside this room. Enemy ships and planes for him are intangible blips on a radar screen. As intangible as the mock sea battle, he'll fight for the next six hours. Weave around 170 as we close the range. Range of bearing now, please. Patrol boat. Roger. Give me a course, Bob, for, for uh, a thousand yards east. Get him to flash red lights along the bearing, please. Simulate gunfire. Okay, Bob, simulate gunfire, flashing uh, red lights along the barrel. Decrease, 15 knots. Okay. All right, keep a sharp lookout for this patrol boat now. He's into four miles. I don't want to close too fast. Clock, course and speed. Patrol boat. Roger. Right, engage. Zero, eight, four, bearing. Zero, two, zero, two. 
Roger, right past them. They are friendlies. Disregard, they are friendlies. Roger. P-Wave, past Roger. the Melbourne. Consider the patrol boat sunk, Blue returning to station. Closing from 355, present range. Red system, cease firing. Look out, bearing right ahead. All positions, and this is PCO. All quarters, uh, relax. Right, fellas, that's it. All positions, this is PCO. The exercise has completed. Okay, Roger. All positions, this is PCO. All positions, secure fallout. Revert to cruising watches. All right, change over to this cam. Quietly. What's the movie, sir? Yeah, look at that. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Tom? No, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good night. They claim that there's no threat to Australia for 15 years. And that's the time I retire. From now on, all I've got left to look forward to is driving another destroyer, a bigger one, a better one. And that's it. That is the end of my seagoing career. From then till age 55, I join the bureaucrats. I sit and drive a desk. That's the end of the six hour war. From our point of view, it looked to have gone fairly well. We were quick in closing up, and that last raid I thought we handled very effectively. We're now on our way back to join the Melbourne. Our cruising watch closed up quickly and quietly, and that's it for the night. I'm facing a dilemma. Having reached my goal, I feel that everything else will be an anticlimax. I don't really know whether the Navy in the next 15 years or so holds for me what I think a job should. In other words, will I have the same sort of job satisfaction? Part of me says no. But then again, what other jobs are there available for a fellow with 26 years? Narrow, hard, long, channelized uh, profession making to go to.